Hi. All right, let's get started. Um, so I'm Boyan Somers, and today I'll be sharing with you the usability test findings uh, of a test that we did in June uh, this year. And I'll basically be sharing kind of the things that we saw in terms of, well, what users struggled with, but then also the things that actually worked really well with users. So my background is in UX design. I work for a user experience company in the Netherlands, and I do kind of product strategy, but also a lot of user research. So kind of going out and talking to users, uh, and then also more quantitative studies, so like A-B testing, that's kind of also stuff that I do. Um, and apart from that, I'm also the UX maintainer of Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Uh, so that means all the kind of good UX parts I'm responsible for, but also all the things that really suck. Um, doing both. So we had a test with this team um, at the University of Minnesota. And um, basically, so you can recognize, for example, Angie, uh, maintainer or committer of, of Drupal 8 and Drupal 7, and uh, kind of a whole slew of other contributors who are involved in the user experience of Drupal 8. So we ran this study with you know, about eight users, and we were sponsored by these various companies. Uh, so the university, for example, they gave their, uh, their usability lab for us to use. Uh, and then these are all the kind of corporate sponsors that also helped in terms of well, getting all the people there. So what, what is, does a lab look like? Um, well, in, in, in its very basic, a lab is just a computer that we set a user behind. Uh, and in this case, a lab tends to have a little bit more kind of uh, functionality than something you do on your own. So for example, in this case, um, you know, it had that kind of one-way mirror. It had a neutral facilitator. So uh, we had someone who works at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and he's you know, a professional moderator. He did all of the kind of testing for us. So he didn't have any kind of bias as to what Drupal should or shouldn't do. Uh, then you have you know, cameras, microphones, basically everything to make it uh, as easy as possible to observe what the user is doing on the computer. Uh, next to that, we also had uh, users who had the motor mobile phone. So they were using the mobile phone and the desktop during this session. Um, and, and finally, we also live streamed all of this. So um, we had quite a few people who were kind of watching in live as we're doing the sessions. So why did we actually go out and test uh, Drupal 8? Well, first of all, we wanted to kind of understand whether you know, our kind of expectations of what, how usef useful and usable Drupal 8 is, whether that was correct. You know, we, we actually changed a lot since Drupal 7. Um, I think if you install Drupal 7 and put that next to Drupal 8, you'll see a lot of differences in the interface. So we wanted to validate, you know, are we actually making the right choices in terms of uh, improving the interface? And then we wanted to identify issues that we could still solve before release. So back in that time, it was so June. I think we had, well, we thought we had like only a couple months left. Um, turned out to be a, f a few more months, but um, still, we didn't have that much time. So any kind of critical thing, things that we really had to fix before release. And then finally, we wanted to kind of explore the bigger issues. So the things that we couldn't quite solve in like a four or five month time span, but we could actually you know, figure out you know, what is actually causing it. So the kind of bigger issues. So the approach that we took is we took seven users um, who all are site builders in some way. So they're either front-end developers, back-end developers. Uh, five of them had actually used Drupal 7 before. And all of them were experienced site builders. So they used WordPress, you know, Drupal, uh, Joomla. They knew HTML. Um, and you know, quite a few of them knew PHP. So these are the people that should be able to use Drupal 8. Uh, these are the people that are familiar with site building, familiar with the concepts. So these are people that, if they're faced with our system, should know how to use it. Um, and we presented them with a few scenarios. So basically, you know, we sit, sit them behind the computer and ask them to kind of do various scenarios with Drupal, uh, Drupal 8, and kind of see if they can execute them successfully. So we asked them to create content, to you know, add a link, to create a content type, create some fields with that, then create a session based on that content type, 
uh, and then create a session on their mobile phone and then also edit this in line on their mobile phone. And the last thing was to place a block, an existing block. And this was all given in the context of that there, you know, the context of the website that they were building is for a local community that's organizing an event. And in this case, they were, I think, organizing an event for the preservation of the Mississippi River, uh, which was uh, appropriate because we were in Minneapolis and the river was quite close to where we were doing the testing. And during the session, um, they were also given a help desk, um, quite often manned by myself or Angie. And we basically asked them to, um, well, call whenever they needed help. Um, sadly, we don't really have a help desk. There's no number if you install Drupal on who you can call to get help. So, um, you know, this is something that's only appropriate in that kind of context. So, well, this is just kind of a picture. So it was all in the basement of Minneapolis. So we didn't have see any light for, I think, seven days. Um, but um, it was worth it. So the process that we took is, you know, as you're kind of doing these sessions, um, you're seeing a lot of issues that come up, a lot of things that you go like, oh, that could be different, that could be better. So as we were doing those uh, sessions, we were identifying, like, what are the things that people run into, the problems that they see uh, that keeps them from using it effectively or at all. So we identified the issues uh, and then we assessed, you know, how critical are these issues? Are these issues that, well, I mean, it's a stumbling block but they kind of get over it real quickly? Or is it something where, you know, they keep wandering around for five minutes trying to find the functionality that's right there but they're just missing because of a you know, visual design issue? So we're really trying to assess how big of an issue is this in terms of getting them to complete their task. And then finally, um, you know, we have kind of suggestions based on top of that. So from the problems and the big problems that we saw, like what are the kind of suggestions that we could come up with that could resolve this issue? Uh, and so we did that all kind of in a group effort. So let me start off by telling you, well, what worked well? Um, and actually, quite a few things worked really well. So we introduced a lot of new features um, I think mobile being the biggest one in terms of really changing the user experience. Um, I don't know if you've tried using Drupal 7 on the mobile phone. It's, it's not that nice. Um, there's, there's quite a few issues that you run into that makes it really hard to use it on a mobile phone. And um, with Drupal 8, you know, this is quite different. So what we saw is that people really like Bartik, for example. Bartik was already an example of something that was mobile friendly from the get-go. Uh, you know, the menu options, all of those options were able to use really quickly. And the big task that we gave them, which is, well, I think at the core of a CMS, is adding content. Uh, they were able to do that quite uh, effectively without much trouble. And um, to be honest, to my surprise, but also to the surprise of the team, uh, the WYSIWYG editor that we now have in Drupal 8, Seek Editor, worked quite well. Uh, people were able to uh, effectively, you know, mark things bold and underline and do all of those tip typical kind of tasks uh, that we thought would be quite difficult uh, because of, you know, the size of buttons and all of that. Um, and also the sidebar, so the new kind of toolbar that we now have in Drupal 8, uh, which is, you know, largely implemented to make it uh, friendly for the mobile phone, also got used really well. So. Continuing on the WYSIWYG, um, so this is really a big thing that we introduced and ought to be a major kind of, you know, usability boost. Um, and we found that people actually could use it quite well. Um, there, there are quite a few preconceptions about WYSIWYG editors. Users starting out saying like, you know, they don't know what the markup is going to look like and they're expecting there to be issues. And um, what we found actually there weren't that many issues. People were actually pleasantly surprised by the fact that it handled you know, scenar typical scenarios for a lot of people, like copying and pasting from words quite well. Uh, and we all get this by default from CK Editor. And also placing images. Um, if you remember how that works in Drupal 7, it's quite tricky. It's, it's not that easy, and you need a lot of contrib modules to actually make that a kind of seamless experience. And in Drupal 8, you can kind of do that out of the box. Uh, and inserting an image like this. 
So another thing that we saw that worked really well is the content preview. So the way that the content preview works in Drupal 7 is you press preview, and then you get like two display modes or views of the same thing in your administrative team in the overlay. And uh, I don't know, it's just confusing. Um, and we saw that over and over again when we were doing the testing, that people were like, why am I not seeing the preview on my actual website? So what we've done in Drupal 8, if we actually made the content preview live, you know, you, when you press preview, it actually shows you in Bartik. And this was well received. Uh, people were able to switch display modes quite effectively. And people were able to navigate back to editing the content item that they were previewing. So that worked really well. Um, another thing that worked well was um, the auto-completion. So when you add a menu link in Drupal 8, um, instead of having to kind of remember or you know, go back and forth between your content item and the menu link you're creating, uh, you're now able to autocomplete based on the title of the content item. And um, we thought that this could be potentially quite a difficult interaction because, well, it's something that's not really common in Drupal. And um, people were used to be able to put paths in there. So uh, once we tested this, we just saw like what's the natural first step that users do? And that was actually typing in, you know, the name of the thing that they were gonna refer in that link. So um, yeah, we found that people were able to use this and they didn't run into any troubles with kind of putting in a URL uh, because that kind of directly put them into uh, the URL mode that this widget has. Another thing is the tabs. So if you look at the tabs here, um, it's all on the right. And uh, this made it that people actually miss them quite a lot. So when we were asking them to, you know, for example, in this case, um, look at the teaser view of the article display mode, people weren't quite sure where to look and quite often missed kind of all of this navigation. And um, we saw that this was a really big trouble because this is a main navigation pattern, right, in Drupal. If you don't use the tabs effectively, you're gonna miss critical functionality. So what we did in Drupal 8, is we actually move this around. So they're now all the way on the left, um, and they're styled quite differently to make sure that you're actually able to notice uh, these elements. So again, this is one of those kind of slightly small things that you don't maybe notice, but things that have a big UX impact in terms of making Drupal easier to use. Um, so this is the action tabs, but then what's not working well? Um, Sadly, this is not a small list, um, but, but we'll get through it today. So the first thing I think I want to point out, when, when we think about Drupal, and, and I think if you explain this, Drupal, to you know, your peers, um, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna try and explain you know, what are the words that Drupal uses for concepts that are also in other CMSs, and we have kind of our own way of labeling a lot of these things. Uh, you know, sometimes sensible labeling, uh, but in a lot of cases, just really complex ways of saying the same thing. Um, and we have lots of them. You know, we have nodes, we have entities, we have view modes, display modes. Um, we have just so much that whenever people come into it, they have to learn all of these just, just words. And all of these words are all tied to each other in, in different concepts. So, you know, in WordPress, you don't have to figure out how to place your block inside your view, inside your region, inside your homepage. Like all of these interlinking concepts uh, make it really hard to figure out how Drupal is constructed. And um, similarly we see, you know, when we're for example not leading with the right concept. So, you know, what's a drop down, what's a checkbox? That's what it's called in HTML. So people who knew HTML were looking for these concepts in the Drupal interface, and, and for example, with these things in the field UI, we refer to kind of the data storage model and not so much the widget. And I think this one is most striking. You know, if you use Drupal, um, you're not gonna be able to make any other website. So it feels, to people, it felt like they were kind of being siloed into one approach, 
and one way of thinking and one way of wording all of these different types of functionality. So how can we fix this? Um, well, that's actually quite tricky. Um, there's been a lot of resistance, I think, within the community. We've all kind of learned to uh, well, understand and in some cases like all of the different words that we're using. And uh, this means that for you know, changing it, we need a lot of community buy-in, essentially. But we also need to do it at the right time. So we didn't do a lot of changes in the wording for Drupal 8. Um, and we likely won't be doing a whole lot in terms of you know, the point releases, so 8.1 or 8.2 or 8.3. Uh, very simply because whenever you're changing a word like you know, taxonomy or view modes or display modes, changing these words, it's an ecosystem-wide change, right? Because all of a sudden, everyone who has written a book, who has made a screencast, or you know, wrote documentation for their client, has to update this documentation to use the right words. So, um, well, that, that makes it that any change we are making on that uh, field, you know, it can happen, but uh, we need to be really sure that it has the proper UX. Um, so a lot of the things that we will likely do is um, you know, figure out how we can communicate the concepts better uh, or introduce new UIs that, that you don't necessarily need to know all of the words in order to use. Another thing that we're thinking about is doing a terminology review. And um, at the very core, it's about basically giving people like a set of concepts, for example, screens or something else that describes basically the functionality and asking them to name it. Like, how would you name that? And basically doing that for all of our functionality. So to understand what is the common kind of language that users use. Uh, so what should we be changing kind of towards? Uh, but this is quite an involved process. So we're thinking that most of this will be Drupal 9. So for uh, another task that we gave them is to do this placing an existing block. Um, and if you're familiar with Drupal 7, you know, the way to do this is to go to the bottom, uh, to pick it out of your disabled block and to drag it up uh, or to change the region. For Drupal 8, this is quite different. We really changed the Drupal kind of block experience around. And um, we wanted to ask people, you know, could you actually find a block that's on the left side um, of your page? So on the home page, for example. Um, no, place a block on the left side that displays all the people that have recently registered for the conference. You know, this was the context that we gave them, and we asked them to just go about and find out how to do that. So the first thing that they encounter is, okay, I want to add a block on my homepage. So they go to their homepage, and they go like, oh, I want to add a block here. Wait, wait, I can only configure a block here. How do I add a block here? And this is very common. Um, whenever people are thinking about building their website, they're thinking about you know, the thing that's, that their client is seeing, that they are seeing in the end. So with you know, contextual links, we give them kind of the indication, like you know, this is where you can jumpstart, basically getting into the configuration of items on your front end. Uh, but we don't allow you to actually add things. Uh, so that's kind of missing. Uh, a lot of contrib modules do add this. So they were looking to find out, you know, how do I add something here? Um, and instead, they have to go to this interface, which doesn't reflect, basically, the website at all, and kind of imagine where those regions would be, and then just go and place one. Um, that's quite a different way of thinking about it, right? So what I want to do is show you a quick video of one of the users trying to do this. So. Um, I want to place it on the home page, so I know I need to go into uh, structure, and then I want to choose block layout on the list here, and um, I'm scrolling down to look for the block I just created.
we, we had to speed it up because he's he's looking around for a long time. Um, I just noticed we have a custom block library. Clicked on that and. quite succeed um, and and so what, what what's really causing this so for some reason um, it didn't quite catch on that basically in order to add a block that's already existing all you have to do is go to the right side of the page find that existing block and place it and well, why is this um, oh let me make sure there we go so this is basically because this is how users see the page. They go like, you know, all my critical functionality is on the left side. What's on the right side, and can kind of ignore. And especially with eye tracking, you can really see this, because you see that the eye almost never kind of goes to the right side of the page. And a lot of this is, well, part, this is just normal internet behavior, right? Like, Typically on websites, whatever is on the kind of right-hand side is supplementary information. It's not the key information. It's not the key functionality. So this is already a mental model that's built up. This is already how they know how to use websites. And actually when they're using, say, the content creation page, we're teaching them, them this concept, right? Because we're giving them the content creation page and we're saying all of the meta information, all of the information that no, you might want to change, but you don't necessarily need to change. It's all on the right-hand side. And on, on Drupal 8, on the blocks page, we do something completely different because we basically the critical functionality of the blocks page is all on the right side. So yeah, that, that makes people go look around. And sometimes they end up in the wrong place. So in, in this case, a user actually went to add a custom block which is completely different. And it won't give you the possibility of adding you know, an existing block, which is already there. And similarly, you know, they, they click Add Custom Block because that's what we tell them, right? If you go to all of these other interfaces in Drupal, the way to add something to a listing is to press Add at the top. And instead here, we use this different pattern as well, where you actually have to go to the side and add from there. So there's a lot of conflicting models here, and, and all of these basically led to people not being able to place an existing block, which is a very core part of, well, building a Drupal site. So basically, you know, how do I add something to this one is basically what people are trying to figure out. Now, even if we don't fix that, you know, uh, that mental model of you know, adding something to the front end, adding something from the back end, um, people still want to know, how do I add something here? So how do we fix this? Well, actually, we found that this was such a critical issue that we had to resolve it before Drupal 8 was out. So it's fixed in Drupal 8. And at the very core, it's, it's relatively simple. So what we did is the sidebar didn't work. Found that out. Let's throw it away. And let's replace it with something that does work. Uh, no, to be able to just place uh, a block from the different regions. So you can go to the region, say, I want to place a block, and then you basically get a list of all the blocks that are available and select them and add them. Uh, and that's about it. So, so that's obviously kind of the fix for uh, making the blocks page kind of work better. There are still 
kind of this you know uh, mental model of you know, the f you know website itself being able to add things from there so I think there's there's many more kind of opportunities to improve this um, one of them being yeah to able to kind of preview block placement so right now if you place a block you can't actually know where it's going um, until you look at your you know, website and you see where the block is so being able to preview, similar to how we do content preview, being able to do that with blocks. Uh, but then also being able to add a block from the region. So using contextual links, for example, allowing that to actually allow them to add stuff. So in Drupal 9, we can do a lot to do this. But I think in a lot of the point releases, you know, this, this won't be something that uh, disrupts any existing functionality. So it will all be new things that we can do to change it. And um, moving on, the other big task that we gave them is creating content type with fields. So we gave them the task to create a session content type. Uh, so for all of their presenters to put in their sessions. So, well, uh, the, the main difficulty that people had is not really in the concept itself. Quite often they navigated to the right place to go to. Um, but users were just unsure how to approach actually creating the right fields uh, for this content type. So I'm going to show a quick video again. And then I've got the interface where I can add my fields that I need. Um, so the first one. I'm going to add the session tracks and then um, for field type, I'm going to use um, actually one of my options here. Existing fields and then those that are working. Um, so I want something that's going to be like a list that I can create, so I can just put those five options in there. Um, so let's see, it's not just looking at my field type selections and I'm not immediately seeing He was very thorough. He wants to make sure you make the right choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think I might just be running into um, limitations of my site building knowledge, too, possibly. Um, so let's see here. I'm just going to go with my intuition and do list, and then I'm going to call it. Track, save and continue. Okay, so this is actually giving me what I wanted. Um, I feel like the the names were a little were not as intuitive as I would like them to be in you know the list of field types, but um, I think that's maybe kind of a overall Drupal issue and not something that's specific to the way that this is designed. So um, again, well, terminology issues, um, but also just the fact that you have to really know what each of these field types means in terms of what you will get out of them, um, yeah, gets people to be able to not successfully complete this task. And making fields is at the very core of what Drupal is about, right? If you don't know that concept or are not able to use that really well, you don't learn about, well, basically what Drupal's best at. So again, we ran into this problem, which we also saw with the blocks interface, is this kind of front to back mental model. So you know, the interface that we present to users is the interface that we have for you know, building the data structure. And 
what people think about is, you know, I'm creating a form for my presenters to put content in. And therefore, they're really thinking about all of these widgets. So they're thinking about, you know, I need to make a select list for my tracks to be selected. I need to make like a radio you know, to say whether you have you know, the content available. Or I need a drop down. So again, they were really thinking about what's presented to them in the end. And the admin interface that we provide them to do this is very much disconnected from this kind of experience. So if we, if we then end up on, on this page, um, you're really just not quite sure what's happening. Um, and we, we show them all of these steps that are dis disconnected. And to some extent, this is actually a regression from Drupal 7. So if you use Drupal 7, uh, we had kind of a different way of adding fields. And it would always show the possible widget types that are available when you're selecting the, the field uh, or the database storage type. So there's actually a regression here, and um, we didn't quite think of it. When we put it in, we thought it was going to be easier, because it was going to be more consistent. And then, well, a lot of users actually made it past the fact that, you know, where are you at these things? But then you present them with this list. Uh, and as you can see, the options aren't listed in you know, importance or commonality or frequency of use, uh, but they're ordered alphabetically. Um, the options don't inform you what you will get, like what kind of widgets would be available if you were to select that one. And, and the text options, I don't know, I think they're just plain confusing. Like, do, like text plain, long, text format along with summary text, low, like which one do you select if you want a text field? Um, I think if you're familiar with Drupal, um, you might know what these options are. If you're not familiar with Drupal, you just see like, I don't know, five different ways of doing a text and a list, uh, which also is text. So um, this is quite difficult, right? Uh, and a lot of this is based on the fact that we present this because this is the way that we store it in the database. And we actually had one user who went out and searched, what is Boolean? Like, I think I should know this. I think that will help me. Um, and well, he found out. So the process that we take for adding a field, um, and in particular, taxonomy field, which is something that we added. So uh, we added kind of a, a different way to reference to different things, uh, taxonomy terms being one of them. Um, and um, in Drupal 8, we now have kind of a different way of doing this. So, um, the sequence of these tasks, though, is quite confusing. So if you have your taxonomy term, um, there's a type of item that you can reference. So basically, when you're adding a field, you're saying, I want a taxonomy term. But then when you've added that field, you get the option again, in case you weren't sure or something. I don't know. Um, but you can change it. And people are like, I think I picked this before. Like, do I now pick something different? Like vocabulary or something else? Um, so this, this is quite confusing, right? And then once you actually end up choosing it, um, when you see it on the listing, it's called entity reference. It's not called taxonomy term reference or anything to do with taxonomy term. So this whole experience takes you through kind of two steps where you're kind of being thrown on the wrong foot uh, because we didn't quite think about the whole flow. And, and this happens quite often. When we go through this, this kind of process in, in the, the core issue queue, quite often you're looking at screens and screens and you're making them as perfect as possible. But then once you put everything together and all the patches and everything comes together, the actual whole flow is quite confusing. So, well, this is clearly something that we have to resolve. Um, we didn't resolve it for Drupal 8, um, but we're going to probably resolve it in a point release. So, um, well, one of the things we can do is, you know, actually look at the whole field UI, uh, but we also have to look at all of these individual interactions. So, after release, we want to look at, you know, uh, can we provide a field selection interface? 
So when you're adding that field, field selection interface that at least indicates kind of what get you, widgets you would get. Um, so a way of doing that is similar to what, for example, Fuels does, where it's just a nice listing uh, with some examples. Uh, the more kind of um, advanced and more kind of you know, radical way of looking at this is you know, really diving deeper into you know, these types of form builder interfaces that have been quite popular over you know, the last few years to kind of make your interface uh, map closely to those widget types. Um, but there's a lot of discussion in the community about this particular solution. Um, and then um, the last thing I want to share in terms of things that didn't quite work well is the home page. Um, which, which one here is the home page? Is it the left or the, or the right? Left. left? All right. Well, it's, it's not really that easy to see. Uh, I think for our, us Drupalers here, we see that, oh, the tab is slightly more white in color and Oh, I can see the, the, the note tabs. Oh, yeah, the RSS feed icon. Well, you definitely have to know Drupal to know that that is about the home page. So again, uh, when we asked people, for example, to make content, they were thinking that the home page um, is actually just like their article page, and there's no difference. Um, so and this is, again, because what we do is actually quite old in a way. It's quite old school to have like a listing of all your things on your home page. Because nowadays a lot of default home pages are like static pieces of content. Or there's part of it that are dynamic, uh, but you know, there's kind of a main message or something that really tells you, you know, this is the landing page. This is the thing that's gonna explain you why you know this particular website is important. So how can we fix this? Um, well, we can do a lot of different things. Um, so we can add elements to the home page that make it a little bit more clear that this is a different page than, um, than an article page by you know, using the teaser differently, by having like a list of items rather than you know, teasers for everything. Um, and in 9, in Drupal 9, we could put potentially introduce a new team. I think this is even possible in a point release. We could do it in 8x. Um, Revamping Bartik might be harder to do in, in uh, 8 because you know, uh, there will be people that just install Drupal and just have Bartik as their team. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's at the very core um, yeah, how we can fix this issue. Um, well, there's a lot of problems that we want to solve. Um, so if you want to help out, uh, you can go to this meta issue and it will list, I think, some of the 40 issues that we found during the testing. Uh, and then there's also this stack, you meant 2015. Um, so that's, well, that, that are basically the findings of the Drupal 8 study that we did. Um, I want to take a little bit of time to go through kind of how we could potentially solve this more systematically. So uh, I think, you know, if you've noticed, you know, the usability of Drupal hasn't been great for a long time. Uh, and we've been trying out all kinds of ways to solve it. Um, and now we're looking into for Drupal 8 and moving forwards, uh, whether we could you know, use a different model to improve our usability, to basically do it faster, uh, and to make sure that new things get, that get in uh, are actually usable from the get-go. So, so what is really the kind of systematic problems that we face? Like why is Drupal far less usable than other systems? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons to that. Um, first of all, it's the process. So it's really difficult to kind of navigate the Drupal process, especially when it comes to the user interface. Um, you really have to know that there's going to be like 40 people that you know, don't like it that you move the button from the left side to the right side, even though it's right. And it is easy to derail. Like a lot of issues that we work on that try to improve the uh, Drupal experience, they are in the 250 comment range, simply because you know, there's a lot of small things that could easily derail, derail the, the conversation. And then it is a significant investment to do this. Like any small change to the interface takes a lot of time. Um, and well, Gabor, you could probably say a lot about investment in time uh, about that. So another thing 
so that's, that's the process. But then if we look at the product itself, um, we have a lot of UX depth. So a lot of our core interfaces are actually haven't changed a whole lot in the last six to seven years. Um, if you install CCK and you install Field UI, it's really not that different. And same with Fuse, you know, if you install Fuse in Drupal 6 with the Fuse 2 UI, it's the same as if you have it in Drupal 8. So in these kind of primary building tools, like the things that we use to differentiate ourselves from all of these other tools uh, out in the market that generally don't have these tools or are not, at least not as advanced in these site building tools, all of these main differentiators haven't changed much and could all be much more usable. And then there's the market. Uh, if we think about you know, what, what's systematically wrong, well, market perception of Drupal is that Drupal is hard to use. Um, and um, you know, this makes us lose traction uh, with a lot of, well, kind of uh, mass market adoption. Um, and the market is obviously changing, right? Like, you know, uh, microservices, APIs, kind of this decoupled CMS, um, it is becoming more and more uh, important to match that. So thinking about that, how could we resolve it systematically? Um, well, first of all, I think we could adapt common practices. So one of the main things that has been kind of going on in the industry for the past few years is kind of this concept of lean UX. And basically, it's about iterating quicker. So whenever we have a new ID, to not work on that for you know, two years, put it in core, you know, wait for another year, and then have the real market say you know, it's good or bad. Um, but essentially doing the smallest prototype possible and um, basically validating that early on. So the whole point is that we basically make this circle of, oh, of well, IDs, building, coding, uh, measuring, having the data of that and then learning again and creating new IDs to do that iteration quicker. Um, but basically, yeah, uh, build, measure, learn. So what that means is that we try to validate these concepts much quicker. So for example, having this kind of as a template for each of those new features that we put in. So you know, we believe that doing this for these people we will achieve this outcome. And then we'll validate it if we see this market feedback. So you know, the biggest thing there being is what's the smallest thing we can build to basically get this understanding of whether our users find it interesting, usable. And then um, w what's the smallest thing that we can measure to validate that this is right? Um, so no kind of big you know, surveys for each functionality, but you know, the smallest possible test we can do to learn whether it's good or not. And then, well, learning from that. So learning uh, much quicker whether our IDs are good uh, and not wait, well, essentially five years. Uh, between every release to see if, if we're doing well. And what will help a lot is our new kind of um, uh, release model. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, a key part in this is, is going for the most you know, big impact things first, right? You know, before we get into our risky assumptions that we could, you know, that could create our entire business, what do you think of this font color on this packaging burst? And this is not uncommon. Um, we spend a lot of time like discussing fonts and the colors to use in the team and whether we should have a Drupicon or not on all of our screens everywhere. Um, we have a lot of these discussions and they don't have a really big impact, right? A real big impact is changing the field UI, is changing the block UI, is changing the way you enable modules, the way you install modules, the way you use modules. So um, a key change for us in the community is also to start kind of focusing on in terms of UX on the changes that really have an impact on um, changing the perception that our users have and the ability of them to complete new tasks with Drupal. So a part of this will be uh, this kind of experiments package. So in Drupal 8, we now have uh, a module package in core, but it's basically a category um, that we can use to put experimental stuff in. 
And, and what this means is that features don't have to be complete before they are brought into Drupal. Uh, this experimental um, kind of package will be the way for everyone here in the room to, to kind of test new functionality before it gets pulled into kind of the real, uh, real package. And in part, we want to do this because we believe that features can only really mature if they're being tested with the real world. So when you know, it's actually being used by everyone and everyone's trying it out and giving us feedback, that's much richer than uh, basically you know, going out and doing small tests on our own and having only that feedback from the core developers. So uh, you know, the experiment package will be a big part of this strategy of kind of continuously adding features to core and maybe not mature, but uh, mature enough for us to get more feedback on it and to improve it. Um, and, and that's all that I wanted to present today. So, thank you. All right, are there any questions or ideas on how we can kind of you know, solve all of these issues? I think it's, I think, well, it's, it's interesting because uh, basically it tries to tackle everything, right? And I think that's one of the interesting things is that we have to test how the whole Drupal experience will be if we change all of the words rather than change them one at a time. Um, so I think it's a really good use case for that. Um, and yeah, it, I think especially for Drupal 9, it will good, be a good to test case to see what works and doesn't work. Yeah. All right, uh, other questions? IDs? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, there's different fidelities, right? So uh, we could have the fidelity where we went out and talked to six people in the market, basically, six of our users, and asked them what they think about this feature, whether it was useful for them, whether they're able to use it. So that is the kind of the you know, uh, lowest kind of denominator of kind of market feedback we can get. The highest denominator is putting it in experimental, uh, putting it in the core product, seeing how many people you know, enable that module at first, um, seeing how many people you know, report bugs on that, but then also seeing you know, is there any kind of feedback on you know, blogs, Twitter, all of those places of people saying that whether they like it or they don't like it. Um, so those are kind of the yeah, two very uh, far edges, and then there's a lot of in between where we could do surveys or other tools to get this kind of feedback, whether it's good or not. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, uh, other questions? No? All right, thank you. <laughs>